Welcome to the Ten Commandments of Screenwriting. Essential things to grasp about the magical craft of screenwriting. Script to screen, coaching and courses for screenwriters. Hi, I'm Alan Denman. And this is me, in sat on a grave in Forever Hollywood Cemetery in uh, Los Angeles. And as it so happens, it's the grave of Cecil B. DeMille. Um, and he was a famous Hollywood director in the glory days. He died in 1956, famous for huge, lavish productions. And interestingly, his last movie was The Ten Commandments. Um, and I'll say a little bit about the Ten Commandments in just a second, but let's say a little look a little bit at what I do. Well, um, what is script coaching? Um, now, this is one of the things that I do. I've worked with thousands of writers through the years from all over the world, and uh, I see script coaching as something as different, as distinct from script consultancy. This is what traditionally has been the case. Uh, writers will produce a, a full-length draft and give it to a script consultant for feedback. But often, by this time, things are, have become rather set in stone, and it's more, more difficult for writers to change fundamental elements of the script. I like the idea of coaching, that I'm working side by side with a writer as they develop their screenplay from the first idea to the final draft. Um, uh, so rather like a sports coach, I work alongside writers step by step, helping them develop their story and their screenplay. And to help writers, uh, you guys out there, I've produced my own online intro series. And this is all about the preparation for the first draft. And I'll say more about this, but this is really years of knowledge that I'm distilling here as to how in a really strong, secure and organic way you can develop your idea through different stages before you get to your um before you get to your first draft I, I remember years ago going to a screenwriting seminar and there was a young woman there who had been writing a screenplay for a long long time and she had all these pieces of string uh and clutched in her hand and at the end of each piece of string was a word or a phrase representing a character or a scene and i thought wow this uh, person needs some guidance here uh, and, um, you know, that, that, that's really where I come in. I, I've be, been able to, uh, gather information all the way through my career from the early nineties onwards. And I've been able to also articulate it so I can help people. In fact, what happened to me, um, this is my story. I went to a screenwriters conference in, uh, 1990 on the South Bank in London. This was a sort of eureka moment. It was really like, wow, this is really the kind of writer I want to be. This is what I want to do with my life. I want to write screenplays. And um, it was great, you know, that sort of first uh, burst of energy where you're learning a lot and so forth. But then uh, as I look back on my journey, I realized there were so many things I didn't know then. And I wish that I had then the tools and the knowledge that I have now because there, there were countless missed opportunities producers if i'd known more that i could have worked with and and accelerated my career and and gone somewhere you know uh, uh the, and i miss these opportunities and i don't want you guys to do this i want to give you what i've learned so you have a really clear roadmap um and when you've written your screenplay uh i also have coaching packages for you developing your script from first draft through to the final draft, getting it ready for uh, for um, presentation to the industry to send out to producers and agents and so forth. This is very important uh, that you know that the script is written in a way that is going to be very attractive and and easily received, well received by producers and agents. Okay, the Ten Commandments. Well, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, a slightly tongue-in-cheek um, title for my talk, because, of course, they're 
nothing in 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 screenwriting is ever a hard and fast commandment um you know there are rules there are guidelines but these are things that I have gathered principles that I've gathered over the years and I use to this day when I'm writing myself as well as as well as when I'm teaching and coaching uh and these are principles that I use to remind myself don't come off track stay focused and this is remember the the, the these principles and they will guide you um and I've also interpreted them in slightly unique ways so you would have heard some of these principles and guidelines before and sayings but um I I give them my own kind of um angle okay so let's have a look at the first one the first commandment is drama is conflict all right and let's begin by telling you a story in fact what I'm going to do is make up this little story and tell you two versions Right. So a man walks into a bar, goes up to the bar and he asks the barman, uh, uh, like a pint of beer, please. And the barman pours him a pint of beer, takes his money and the man drinks his beer. OK, well, that's a, a pleasant enough story, but there's something missing. There is no conflict. It's dull. It's boring. So let's do a second version of this. A man walks walks into a bar goes up to the bar and asks the barman, um, I'd like a pint of beer, please. And the barman looks up and looks him in the eyes and says, I'm not serving you. We don't want you here. You're not welcome. Get out. And the man says, well, hang on a minute. You know, my, my money's good. You know, uh, you, you know, I'd like a pint of beer. Whereupon the barman raises the conflict even higher and gets out a weapon from under the bar. Now we have conflict. We have two people with opposed genders. So this may seem obvious. You know, we think, well, of course, you, you've got to have conflict. But what is the purpose? What's the function of conflict, of having two characters with opposing agendas? Well, let's find out. What conflict produces in us is tension. If we're in a state of tension, we're engaged. So having conflict in your story, conflict on screen, puts us in a state of tension. Now, something neurologically about us as human beings is that when we are in a state of tension, we have to resolve that. We have to get it back in balance. So you can see that a good story is a way of setting up tension and then resolving it and getting us back in balance. What else does conflict and tension do? They keep us on edge and in our seats until the very end of the film, the end of the story. And that's important for commercial reasons as well, because if you can keep an audience in their seats, you are going to increase box office revenue and um, you will be a very popular screenwriter if you can do that. So let's move on a little bit. Um, how precisely do you create conflict and tension? What's the technology for this? Well, in storytelling, the primary method is your protagonist is opposed by your antagonist. Or if we put it more colorfully, the irresistible force meets the immovable object. So you have two opposed forces. Um, and you so think of this like a sports game. You think of it like a boxing match. You know, you've got one guy against another, one side against another. Now, whoever you're supporting, whoever is your team, um, that is you, your protagonist. And the other side are the bad guys. They're the antagonists. They want to defeat you in some way. And now, for stories to really work well and for the level of conflict and tension to function really well, both parties both sides must have valid agendas to produce maximum conflict and tension and just a little side note here is that i find that quite frequently writers will favor their protagonists because really they at a subconscious level they're identifying with their protagonist and that means that they don't have their eye fully on the and on their antagonist 
uh, the antagonist could be two-dimensional, a cardboard cutout, a, um, a stereotypical villain. That's, I would say, is not good enough. Your antagonist, if you could interview them, would give you a very good reason why they should defeat the protagonist and the protagonist should clear out the way. So when you have valid agendas on both sides, you have more conflict, more tension. So uh, in storytelling, you have to rack up the tension. It's one thing to establish it, but then to keep us further engaged, this tension has to grow and grow. So it's a bit like stretching a wire between two points. And the more it's stretched, the tauter it gets, the more engaged we are, and the more we long for some sort of resolution. There's, this is the nature of storytelling. It works upon us at a neurological level. So how do we? ensure that there is uh, an increase of conflict and tension. What are the strategies for this? Well, as I've indicated already, the first thing to do is to build your profiles for the, your protagonist and antagonist so that they are equally opposed. When you're building their profiles, you also want to put in there uh, that maybe they have hidden resources or hidden weapons of some kind. A weapon might be purely a verbal thing, not literally a, a, a gun or some super duper uh, laser beam or something. It, it could be, uh, you know, um, a, a, a piece of intelligence, a piece of information. But this hold back. So you don't want your protagonist and antagonist going hell for leather at each other from right from the get go. You want them to have stuff in reserve because then you know the conflict can rise and that's very important in a story um simply ask also um are the stakes high enough for your protagonist if all they have to do is um you know uh recover their um uh checkbook should we say uh or, or their credit card that's not a very high enough but what if you know, the credit card is access to their account and there's a, gr a million dollars in there. And uh, this is money that has been put aside because they have a, a, a family and one of those kids needs special medical treatment and it's going to cost a hell of a lot of money. And the, now the stakes have got higher and higher. So ask yourself, are the stakes high enough? And if they're not, find a way to raise them. And then also uh, other strategies you can think about is what are the other obstacles? You know, never make life easy for your protagonist. Put things in their way. So it could literally be they're trying to cross a road and uh, there's a car accident and they can't get across or um, there's an earthquake and they can't get to their destination or there's a terrible storm. Um, sometimes the, the other forces of antagonism can come through um, a character as well. So it could be somebody that refuses to give them a key piece of information. You know, never make it easy for your protagonist. Remember, go back to the guy who went into the bar for a drink. First version, he had it easy. That's not going to engage us. That won't keep us gripped in our seats. So just to finish off this then, so uh, drama is conflict and you want that right from page one. Not necessarily full on, you know, hell for leather conflict, but enough as the beginning of tension. It must be right there, there right from the beginning. And here's a sort of other commandment, really, but I put it all under this heading of drama is conflict. Your story is only as strong as your antagonist. So put your protagonist up a tree and give them hell. And I hope you can see the illustration here. I think this is humorous, but I hope it will help you remember this principle here. Here's a bear after a guy up a tree. Um, that's drama is conflict. Number one, let's have a look at number two. Make them laugh, make them cry. All right, this is, let's find out what this principle is about. So just have a look at this picture here. 
This is a photograph of um, people in an audience. And um, I'm asking the question, what's going on when we're watching a movie? Well, now, if you look closely at the faces and expressions and physiology of these people, uh, there's a guy uh, gasping, his eyes, his I suspect his pupils are dilated. Uh, there's a, a, a young woman in the middle there who looks like she's about to cover her face, something she's turning away. Uh, the girl in the front row is, actually has covered her eyes. So w what is going on with these people? Um, what is happening when we watch a movie? Well, we are having emotions. Um, and this is absolutely fundamental to grasp. This is what story, and in particular, filmmaking is about. We can say one def definition, I think this was originally um, generated by Sid Fields, the, the, the screenwriting guru who sadly has just died a month or two ago. He said, a film is a story told in pictures. And I added the bit, it's also told in sound and music. But I have my own definition is that film is, is an emotion generation technology. In other words, it's a technology designed to generate emotion in audiences. How does this technology work? Let's have a look. Well, uh, after doing a lot of writing, looking at many, many films, reading and thinking about this, this is my conclusion that the most fundamental technology uh, here is the identification with your protagonist. All right, so something happens in the first few minutes when we're watching a film. It's a kind of a emotional bonding that takes place between the audience and the protagonist. And, and a perfect example that I like to use is the film Billy Elliot. And Billy Elliot is about a boy growing up in a mining town, a very male-dominated environment, um, who's crazy about dancing and wants to be a ballet dancer. And when we first see Billy Elliot, right at the beginning of the film, we have this boy in the privacy of his own bedroom putting on a scratchy uh, uh, 60s record and dancing and jumping up and down on his bed. And he's free. He's absolutely expressed there's no restriction at all he's he's joyous he's passionate and he's a bit crazy and you know what we love him that bonding has taken place we have identified we care for him um you know we, we admire him his his craziness you know and we also then learn that he's poor and we tend to identify with characters who are low status much more than with characters who are high status and he's also very caring. He he looks after his his gran, who's going a bit dotty. Um, so this is really the one of the most fundamental aspects of this uh, emotion generation technology is identification with your protagonist. So some important questions for you: How does your protagonist enter the story in your script? What is the first emotion you stimulate in your reader or audience when they come in? So don't think about the what is so much. Think about um, that is the, the external, the action and so forth. Think about the emotion that is generated by that. And then ask yourself, what follows? What is the sequence of emotion then? So you might begin with uh, one emotion. How does that uh, sequence into the next one. So we're looking at, if you like, the inside workings of this technology here. I'd like to mention Lacos Egri. Uh, he published a book called The Art of Dramatic Writing uh, in, in the 1940s. And it's the best book on screenwriting, in my view. And it is actually not about screenwriting. It is about the art of dramatic writing. Because when I start off, this is what I mean about I, I didn't know anything like an, enough. I dived in the deep end and I had to learn this stuff. I thought, well, you know, screenplays are pretty easy. It's like a guy gets out of a car. He goes into a house. He comes out. It's, it's, you just describe action. 
But then I realized that the, the, the stories, the scripts I was writing then were very flat. They didn't engage. And then I, uh, somebody gave me this book. It was real one of those magical moments when, when of, of like, almost like the universe says, you need some help. And I got, this person gave me this book and said, you should read this. And it opened my eyes. This was another eureka moment. I realized that, you know, it, it, it screenplays and film is actually about character. And you have to engage us with the character, especially the protagonist. And this color bar that we I'm showing you here, you know, think of each bar as an emotion. So I like to think of uh, the different emotions that we have as being different colors. Um, and we describe people as being red with anger or green with jealousy. Um, so, you, you know, there is this association in our, in our subconscious mind. So this is really uh, like a, this color bar is really the emotional bar of a screenplay or a long story so that we are going through these different emotions, these in sequences. He described the protagonist uh, journey, uh, emotional journey through a story, uh, the prote your protagonist sequence of emotion as the character arc. Um, and you've probably heard that phrase before, but let's have a look at an example of a character arc. And I call this the inside story. The outside story is what happens, the, the events, one thing after another. The inside story is the emotional journey and transformation that a character goes on uh, from the beginning of the story to the end. So let me just, this is one I've just put together myself to, to, to illustrate my point. So let's just um, look at this then. So a character begins in a state of deep isolation. This produces uh, a, a very profound sense of despair. This character has now to do something. So they, they make some effort. They search for love in some form. This is a failure, a disaster. The character could give up at this point, but they don't. What they do is they reevaluate themselves. So they look at themselves and they think, could I have done something better? What, what went wrong? How could I improve things? And maybe at this point also, um, a mentor comes in. And with this uh, mentor coming in, the mentor is able to give a little bit more advice. Uh, maybe this is a journey they themselves have gone on. And this increases the self-belief in the protagonist. The protagonist now says, okay, I'm going to stick to this. I'm going to persevere. I'm determined to make this work. And this leads to a growth of courage. But still, they haven't achieved their goal yet. They have to dare. They have to take action. And when they do, there's triumph. Triumph. There is victory. They achieve their goal. And the end result, the final outcome, is that they find love. So this is the, the, the theoretical character arc. Um, perhaps you can see in your mind already uh, how a character you know, could begin and you, you might see a character or scenes or images or whatever. And, and um, you, you can see the journey that they go on from beginning to end. So they begin in a state of isolation and they end in a state of love. You can't go from isolation to love in one jump. That will be a, a, a character jump. It's, it's really, it would not be believable for a character to go from that to that. And if, if you're aware of character arcs, you can see in certain films and stories where the writer or the writer director have, they've missed out a stage and you think, hang on a minute, that character was really depressed in the last scene and now they're all jolly. What's going on here? There's a jump. So it's very important that you do this, uh, you tell the inside story, the character arc uh, of your protagonist. Okay, let's move on. Let's look at the third commandment, which is seeing is believing. And uh, before we uh, I explain this a little bit, I just want to give you a bit of brain science, all right? Now, you probably know that our brains are incredible 
organic computers uh, that we're still coming to understand more fully and that they have this remarkable feature. There are two hemispheres and a lot of research has been done in this and we know that the dominant hemisphere, which in most of us is uh, our left brain, it, this is responsible for logic, language, science, rationality, this kind of thing. The right brain, the right hemisphere, uh, is subdominant, uh, or we might say more subconscious, and this is responsible for other things. It's responsible for emotion for creativity, for imagination, for intuition. And um, uh, th they work in different ways. So we have the two hemispheres and left and right, and they process information in distinct ways. Just to recap, the left deals with logic and language and processes one thing at a time in a linear fashion. Unfortunately, this is you know, how uh, most of our education is left brain oriented. Um, but we also have a right brain and this processes information in a very different way. It deals with emotion, intuition, creativity, imagination. And it works synthetically by association, bringing like things together. This is where the creative juice of the mind is it's in the right brain where you you know get a, a, a little spark of an idea and probably literally if you could see what's going on in your brain there is a little electrochemical explosion as you get a bright idea you just think about our metaphors for this that there is a little you know electrochemical pulse as as you get a creative idea well something about language that language is, uh, of course, it uses words, um, but where are words? Words are just concepts, um, and concepts are abstract. They exist only in our mind. We cannot see, hear, or feel, or taste them. But something special happens in film, because if you show us images, it's a lovely little painting by Marc Chagall, and play us music, what happens? When you do this, the brain gets tricked into thinking that what you're experiencing is real. And this is especially true when there is a combination of sensory inputs. So if you have image and sound and music and dialogue combined together, which is what happens in film, it creates a kind of fusion and the only way that we can really absorb this and take it in is to use our right brain. Our left brain cannot deal with things because it processes things in a linear way. We grasp or process what's going on much more holistically uh, when we use our right brain. So here I might rephrase or just redefine my, my earlier definition. I would say that film is therefore an emotion generation fusion technology. So it's a technology that fuses different sensory uh, data inputs together to generate emotion within us. I hope this is uh, getting clear to you. So what this means is if you show us, and especially add music to us as well, seeing is believing. If you can show us on screen something happening, there's a part of us actually is going to believe it. It feels real to us. And that's really important. You, This is how we get uh, uh, into a movie is that we somehow suspend our disbelief as a part of us knows that this isn't really true. And yet it feels real. So if you can create a world with consistent rules, and you have great images and you combine the images with sound and music, we're going to believe it's real and anything is possible. It becomes film. This is why I say it's a magical art because anything is possible. Um, in, in fact, the, 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 the very origin of film, the film, the, one of the first filmmakers was a French guy called Georges Méliès, who actually began as a magician and he saw film as a way of kind of doing magic acts. So a character, he would uh, have a character disappear 
uh, from one part of the frame and then appear in another part. And I can, if you can imagine at the time, this would have been incredible for people who've never seen anything like this. So, you know, I've, I've got a, a still here from uh, The Matrix, and uh, which was a pretty incredible film. And, you know, the Wachowski brothers actually had a real challenge on their hands. They, they didn't know exactly how to, to tell executives uh, in, in Hollywood, uh, you know, about their idea and people didn't get it. So what they did is they went away and got a storyboard artist to produce a whole series of images. Then they went back to these uh, the, the, the executives in Hollywood and said, well, this is what it's going to look like now they could start to see it. They could start to believe how this world could operate. And I, and I love The Matrix because it's a perfect example of what I mean. It's, it's such a unique world, but it, it does have its own rules. And we believe it, therefore, because we, we can see it um, taking place. And it, there's a consistency to what's happening. So that's seeing is believing. And you, as writers, can create anything. There are no limits to your imagination, which is what I love about screenwriting. Commandment number four, show, don't tell. So I want to ask you a couple of questions here. Do you know already what kind of writer you are? This is very important because a lot of writers uh, come from other areas, playwrights, novelists, short story writers, um, uh, non-fiction writers, um, they uh, often assume that there's going to be a, a smooth segue into screenwriting. Um, but it's a good question to ask yourself. Are you a novelist, playwright, or screenwriter? How can you tell? Well, as I've already said, film is a visual medium. So really, what a screenplay is, is it's a comic in words. If we were really good as artists, we wouldn't be writing in words. We'd be drawing images. We'd be creating a sequence, like a, a giant storyboard, like, like a comic. Um, and we'd be able to convey our vision very quickly to people because they could see it. So uh, show, don't tell is very important. You've got to be able to visualize things. How can you show, don't tell? And it's important because if you can show something visually, then we're going to believe it, aren't we? So don't tell us that your protagonist is lonely or angry or sad. Don't let them say, oh, my God, I'm so lonely uh, or I'm feeling really angry. I'm, I want to go crazy with anger. Show us. It's much, much stronger. So look at these emotions here. Obviously, the first guy, he is uh, looking pretty angry. The uh, young woman on the right is looking pretty sad and melancholy there. Um, and then we've got the little boy here. Um, I put this in because this illustrates a little bit more about what you can do to visually show an emotion, uh, or a state of emotion in screenwriting. This boy um, is feeding a swan. He's not with another human being. Um, the light is quite dark. It looks like it could be dusk. Um, and uh, his figure is very dark as well. So you were now using a situation. He's talking to an animal. Uh, he's not talking to a human being. Um, and there's a sense of somberness about this as well. So the mood suggests, I would say, loneliness. So now you can start to see you can use a, a, a situation, a location, uh, props, uh, other things like lighting and color to tell us about the mood. And um, this is called really creating a visual system. And, and good films actually do use color and lighting in this way to really affect us. And as I've already indicated that, you know, our emotions and our emotional moods can be uh, depicted visually as in light and color. Um, and directors know this. And it's good to know it also as a screenwriter. 
So show us in images, don't tell us in words. All emotions can be shown through images and also music. So let's just think about music for a moment. One of the major functions of music is that it describes the inner shifting emotions of a character. Um, uh, this is really important. A, a, a film composer I knew in Hollywood, uh, he said, listen to this. And he played me just the soundtrack, soundtrack of a section from Silence of the Lambs. And he said, uh, what do you get? And I realized as I was listening, the music is telling the story in, in musical terms. So the, 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 the dark shift, the stalking, uh, the approaching of, of uh, uh, moving in on a prey. Um, the, the music was really describing the feelings that this uh, that Hannibal Lecter was having uh, as he was uh, going through um, uh, a series of actions. So music describes the inner emotions of a character, and that's really important for engaging us. But one other thing also is that sound design can also perform this function. And I have an example to give you here. Very quickly, sound design is really what is the natural sounds or what we imagine to be the natural sounds of an environment, whether it's you're out in the woods, so it's a little rustling of leaves, bird song, or if you're in an in a office, there's the, the, the um, sort of background hum of air conditioning, of a telephone going off and so forth. And there's a beautiful piece of sound design to, 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 that illustrates the emotion of a character in Godfather, um, the very first one. Michael Corleone, the innocent young son, the war hero, comes back to a war between the different mafia clans. Uh, one of his clan is murdered and he... Uh, he wants to take revenge, despite his father trying to protect him from from uh, the, the, the crime and corruption and death around him. And so, uh, you know, they they agree to let Michael go and meet the corrupt police chief and one of the heads of an opposing clan in this restaurant. And the police chief frisks him and says, OK, he's clean, there's no gun on him. Um, and then Michael Corleone gets up at one point and says, um, OK, if I use the, the, the restroom and uh, OK, yeah, uh, they let him go. And a gun has been planted there and he feels behind the cistern and he, he gets hold of the gun. And at that point, there's a marvellous piece of sound design where a train nearby thunders by. And that thunderous roar of the train is really nothing to do with the train. It's actually depicting the emotion, the fear, the adrenaline in Michael Corleone as he's about to perform this act of revenge. So he goes out, back into the restaurant, pulls the gun, kills the police chief, kills the head of the clan. Look out for that, you know, if you get a chance to, to see that movie and look out for that moment. It's a great piece of sound design. So, show, don't tell. So try this exercise. Um, you know, pull out of actually writing your screenplay for a moment and think about how would you show these following emotions in a character? How would you show regret? How would you show guilt or secret pleasure or longing? And think about what situation, where are they? Are they inside, outside? What's the location? Uh, is there a prop nearby or that something they're holding? What's the lighting? What's the color? All of these things, not all of them necessarily together, but you know, keep it simple. But could you employ any of these things to help show that your character is having um, um, one of these emotions? It's a good little exercise, and I, it's always good to pull out of writing your screenplay and whatever scene you're on to actually you know do exercise it's a bit like kind of doing uh press-ups or something like that you know it, it's good to develop these little side skills and specialize uh, from time to time okay we're moving on and this is a, a well-known saying less is more and uh 
uh, just to help you kind of help illustrate this point, help you remember it, uh, I want to talk about the, the French artist Matisse, beautiful artist, impressionist. Uh, and as he became old, he became infirm and, uh, uh, you know, wheel bound. He couldn't move around. He couldn't paint as he loved to. So he did something amazing. He did these cutouts. He could still hold colored paper. Uh, he could still hold a pair of scissors. And he did these amazing cutouts. He trimmed everything away. He just went to the, the core, the, the, the shape, the movement of, of, figures on their own and created these beautiful beautiful simple uh, pictures and that really is the essence of less is more so it works like this by trimming away excess, excess detail and focusing on the key aspects of a character a plot set location whatever you give those aspects more significance less is more now, this runs counter to how we generally think. We may think that bigger is better and more is more powerful and intense. But if something only happens once in your screenplay, it gains massively in power and significance. So things that, you know, are often used in, in films to, to, for effect to have impact, things like swearing, and car crashes and jokes and fighting, um, uh, you know, they, they can have some impact, but the more you repeat them, the more they lose power with each repetition. You think about a character that only swears once, a character who's so controlled and together and is always cool no matter what's going on, but there's that one moment when they lose it, and this is when they go bananas and they swear. That is such a big moment. Less is more. So um, think about applying uh, this rule, the less is more rule, to your own scripts. Um, ask yourself some questions here. Do you need so many characters in your story? If you start to take out some, it means that you have fewer characters and therefore more focused conflict, more potential for focusing the conflict. And it's easier for an audience to follow as well. So think about that. Do you need so many characters in your script? And do you need your character to talk so much? Less dialogue gives an actor more chance through facial expression and an action to show what they're feeling. Uh, all right. So, you know, to, to a good screen actor, they really don't want a lot of dialogue because they want to be doing things with, you know, a gesture, a facial expression, their eyes, whatever. Whereas if they've got a lot of dialogue to say, it means, you know, they've got to get a lot of dialogue out. Um, so you'll be doing a screen actor as a great favor here. And then what about the way you describe your location or set? Um, if the fewer your words you use, the, the, the more evocative it can be. And it also allows the script to read faster. That's very, very important. I'll come back to that later on. And it gives the art director, when they come on board, more room for their own input. You don't want to be describing, you know, the type of wallpaper on the wall, the Welsh dresser, the crockery stood up in the Welsh dresser and so forth. You, you might want to just describe it as a, an old fashioned 1950s living room or something like that. And let, you know, then it's a fast read. The art director can come in quickly. And something else that often happens, uh, in screenplays is that, uh, writers and the script becomes bogged down by complicated backstory. Backstory is very simply everything that has happened um, with regard to your protagonist or, or another character prior to the beginning of the, the script. Okay. So um, the, here's an example I love to use. There, there, there's a Clint Eastwood movie in which he's asked, well, so what was your childhood like? Now, he could have replied, well, my father beat me. He beat my mother, too. And I, I didn't get fed much. It was really tough. This is what he replied when asked what his child was like. This is what he actually said. Brief. 
think about that. For me, this is the perfect example of less is more. That one word speaks volumes. We get in one word that his childhood was hell and he had to grow up really fast. We don't need to know any more detail. That's conciseness. That is screenwriting at its very best. So we're moving on and here's another commandment that you may have heard before that the writing is in the rewrite so um and i've done this and i know we all do this that we get a new idea for a screenplay and we think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread but what i found with myself and working with other writer that your first ideas are not always the best some ideas do come fully formed but more often than not they have to be teased out. They have to be developed. And as I mentioned at the beginning, that the further you go, the less willing you are to make changes. Um, and that what you really need is you, you need to get trusted feedback from friends, other writers, or get hold of a coach like myself early on. So if I, if I look at this picture now, just turn your eye to that and you see this well, slightly windy or up and down uh, country road here, I would say, you know, your first idea is just coming in at the beginning there, bottom left-hand corner. You know, you start to get your story clear. That's the first bit here. But, you know, you're going to have a lot of other humps to go and, and a long way to go. This is, you know, screenwriting is uh, for, for, for you've got to look at it, the, the, the bigger picture here. You've got to be in it for the long haul. Um, be prepared to play around with your ideas at the beginning. Um, this is very important. So get used to rewriting uh, and don't assume that uh, your script is going to come out fully formed. And don't send it out prematurely. This is very, very important. You only have one shot you must send out your very best draft to a producer, an agent, or reader. Um, now, if your screenplay journey looks like this, this is a, a very, very wiggly mountain hairpin bend, uh, well, if your screenplay journey looks like this, then you're in trouble. You know, you are probably lost. You're not quite sure where you're going. You're feeling like this is an endless battle. Um, and so what you need is a plan. Um, and I just want to take a moment to describe to you my intro series. And there are four classes here. Uh, the first one is Breaking into Hollywood. And this is beginning with your dream. So I give you here some information, really in useful information. It took me years to build up about the nature of the film industry and how it works, how it's structured. And in particular, the, the big thing you, you will learn in breaking into Hollywood is the value of your logline. Your logline is your story concept told in 25 to 30 words. And it must sizzle. This story concept, this story idea must be really good. Um, this, the next class is how to then write a logline, how, how different techniques for developing a really great story idea. And with this, how to write a query letter so uh, you, you know how to present yourself and contact uh, agents, producers and so forth. And then we're going to take your log line and expand it into a synopsis or outline. So now we're starting to bring in uh, other characters. The story is starting to shape up a bit. It has some sort of beginning, middle or end and end. Um, and we're starting to expand it. So this is a really a bit like uh, Russian dolls. You start off small and then you go to the next uh, size you're starting to expand it further uh, and then we, we're we going to take it even bigger this is in the last class how to write a brilliant treatment and a treatment is your film story told uh, accurately and proportionally so that one page equals uh, one page of your treatment should we say equals 10 pages of your script 
and it's told without dialogue. And this is where you really iron out the detail of your screen story. And these four stages uh, will give you a wonderful organic platform for writing your screenplay. If you put your effort in here into preparing for first draft, um, you will be so clear about what your story is. You won't get into deep water. You won't be. Uh, you won't get lost on that wiggly, endless hairpin uh, mountain road. Um, now, some professional writers will do will write treatments and uh, and maybe take three months to write their treatment. Sometimes thirty, forty, fifty pages. But by this time. They know what their script is and they know the story so well that writing the, 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 their first draft is, is going to be easy. And the beauty of this system is that we can go backwards and forwards. So if as you expand your log line into a synopsis or outline, you realize something isn't quite working there, then you can go back a step and readjust your log line. And if something isn't happening, working too well in your synopsis or outline, um, uh, it, you know, when you this will show up in your treatment and you think, oh, I haven't really worked that out. You can then go back a stage and get that clearer and do adjustments to character and plot. And just a note also with these classes uh, that if you register, uh, but you're unable to attend the live class, a recording will always be available, so you won't miss anything. All of these classes have got exercises in uh, for you to do to help you develop your, your skills. Okay, so that's something about the intro series, and this is a, a great plan for you. And just one other thing also, um, I should mention that um, these classes are very affordable. And if you are interested and you want to do all four, then you only pay for three. So you get the fourth one free. OK, and uh, we can um, more information about these is up on my website, which is www.scriptoscreen.com. OK, let's move on. So your goal as a screenwriter with your rewrites is to produce a screenplay that looks like this. It should be sparse, trimmed. There should be lots of white space. It should be a page turner. And think of each page as being like a window to the film that is out there waiting to be made. So we don't want beautiful poetic phrases we don't want great wadges of text we something that is very clear we're almost it's almost transparent the page you're looking through the page to the film beyond and if you write your script in this way you will be beloved of readers and producers because uh, I'm going to ask you for a moment to put yourself in the shoes of readers and producers these guys are reading maybe 10, 15 scripts uh, a week. Um, some readers in Hollywood are on three a day. Uh, and can you imagine when there's a, a densely written script uh, that is, there may be a great idea there, but it's hard going. So you want your script to be a, a fast read. And uh, the ideas have to be great, but the way you write it and the way you present it to the industry, it should be sparse, a fast read, a page turn. OK. So let's move on. I'm going to talk about something which I love to call the pattern of three, it's something I use a lot in my own writing. And I think this is really important. And uh, I have this rather marvelous image here of the three Hindu gods, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. And you'll note that in a number of religions and um, uh, sort of mystical uh, systems that, the, that they recognize that there is this pattern of three in life. And Brahma in Hinduism represents the creative force, the beginning uh, Vishnu represents the stabilization and development of that first energy 
and Shiva represents the dissolution and destruction of that. Really, it's the pattern of three. It's a one, two, three. It's the description of a universal cycle. And I think this also applies to screenwriting. So just as nature uses a threefold process from birth, growth to dissolution, so story really has three stages. And put very simply, basically a beginning, middle and end. Or in screenwriting parlance, you have act one, which is where you set up your characters, you introduce your protagonist and antagonist. We know what the protagonist's goal is. And then Act 2 develops these things, uh, develops the, the plots, and there are, are complications. And then Act 3, uh, there is a climb to a climax, and then finally a resolution so that we come out of it. So very simply, uh, you can think of a screenplay as being in three parts. And you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the three-act structure. And, of course, there's been many uh, other models that have uh, been created, uh, whether, the, whether it's the 12-step uh, hero, hero's journey model or the eight-point model or the 15. I've heard many, many different uh, structural models. But I would say whichever one you choose, at heart, always use a one, two, three rule and uh, think about constructing your story in three stages. And each stage has its own energy, its own tempo, its own tone. So there can be quite an energy to how things begin. And then maybe in the middle, uh, it, it becomes more, uh, slows down slightly, speeds up. Uh, you're not quite sure where it's going. And then the third act, the third stage is things now have to be resolved. There has to be some kind of, uh, resolution of the conflict. So the end, the end tempo picks up as we climb towards the climax. That, that's one possible energy, but this provides you with a structure. Um, so, the, you know, when you're starting to build your story, say at the synopsis or outline stage, you start to then break it down into three stages. Um, and it's a very simple approach, but I find very effective. Now, you can also use the one, two, three pattern for scenes themselves and scene sequences. So you can take a scene and think of that as being a microcosm of your whole screenplay, that it is a three act scene. So a character comes in to a room. He's looking for something. So that's, if you like, the first step. Uh, um, it gets a bit tricky now. He's looking for something. Um, tension is mounting. He hears noises approaching or something. He still hasn't found what he wants. Uh, and then he finds it, some piece of information, a hidden object. And then he or she then has to find a way to get out of the room. So that would be the third part. Um, so you can, it's good to, to use this one, two, three C pattern in constructing scenes and scene sequences as well. And just one other thing I would say is often, uh, you'll see, uh, in films and story that the one, two, three pattern is used to build suspense and increase tension. So for instance, uh, should we say a character goes to, um, uh, find somebody, uh, one night and they knock on their door and there's no reply. They slightly dispirited. They come back, uh, but they don't give up. They go back the next day and they knock on that door with a bit more determination, but still there's no reply. They come back and then the third night they go knock on the door and lo and behold, the door opens. The, the tension is released there, but there is a build-up. So it's that one, two, three pattern is very useful. If you if you, you, you look at films and, and little um, parts of the story, you'll often see the one, two, three pattern working there. It's a good structure. Okay, so we're coming towards the end. We're looking at the commandment number 10, a script is a blueprint for production. Okay. You may have a degree in literature. You may have an incredible grasp of the English language. You may have a fantastic vocabulary. 
but I have to disappoint you. Your script is not a literary work. It's a set of instructions. And this is really important for you as a screenwriter to grasp. And I think this is a, 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 a vital commandment or guideline. So let's take a little bit of, a, of script here. It's just a, a simple example I've created. Exterior house night. A man, Greg, 35, tall and thin, stands peering over a crumbling wall at a dilapidated empty house. He puts his foot on the wall. A brick crashes to the ground. He freezes. Okay, it's it's written simply as screenplays should be be written, uh, and it looks like well, it's just telling the story. But actually, if we look more closely, all of these things are instructions. So, exterior is an instruction to the producer, uh, um, uh, the 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 director really to everybody working on the film that this is going to be outside um, the uh, location manager and production designer need to look for a house what kind of house is it oh it's dilapidated and empty um, very important for the cin cinematographer and uh, his or her crew is that it's night time so yeah we're going to need extra lights all right so that just that little scene heading is a whole set of instructions then we have an instruction to the director and casting director they're going to need an actor well what kind of actor well a man around 35 and he should be tall and thin not short and podgy uh, and so there's a direction to to get a particular type of actor um, and then these are directions to the actor he stands peering over a crumbling wall Okay, so there's his direction. Uh, he puts his foot on the wall, a second direction to the actor. A brick crashes to the ground. You notice the word crashes is capitalized. That That is an instruction to the sound recordist to capture that sound because this is going to be there in the final cut. They need that sound. So all of these things, if we look more closely, this apparently very simple bit of script is actually a set of instructions to everybody involved. So how do you learn this? Well, the only way I learned this was actually by making a, a film. And uh, the, the first film I made, a short film, 12 minutes long, which was called If You Go Down to the Woods, I had like a mini crew and it was designed like a proper shoot. And I learned what everybody's roles were. And I think that's the only way you can really learn as a writer uh, that your script is a blueprint um, and you've got to go out and shoot it. Um, now, you may not want to direct yourself. You may not want to produce, but there are plenty of people who will do this. And um, you can see how accurate your script is. Was it a good blueprint? Were there clear instructions? Um, you, did people understand what they had to find, say, do, get, and so forth? If your script is clear, the, it, it is going to be a good, clear blueprint, and people will get it. Um, start off by making a short film, and the, that's, uh, you know, five, ten minutes, something like this. And that's a great way to learn. Okay, we're on to the last commandment here, and uh, this is something that you maybe not have heard of before, but I think this is really important because you don't want to just be a screenwriter. You want to be a successful screenwriter. So every line you write is a business decision. It's not just a piece of art and storytelling. It is also a business decision because you want success. So to be more than an artist, to truly succeed in the film industry, to sell your script, to get a producer to buy it and make it, you must understand this, that every line you write is a business decision. What do I mean by this? Let's give some, let's illustrate this. A few questions to ask yourself. How does your script open? Does it begin with two people talking for 10 minutes over a cup of tea? Or does it begin with a gripping chase through uh, the back streets of a darkened town? Wow, that's going to grip people. Um, how does your protagonist first show up? 
um, you know, are, are they doing something interesting that, that is going to want an actor uh, to play this part? Um, and, and, you know, research has been done into this. And what does what makes an actor choose a part? It's they see themselves being that person. They really want to be that person, that character. So you have to put something in uh, the profile of your protagonist and in the way that they're, you bring them in to uh, get an actor to really want to play this part. And what about the antagonist? Well, how, how do you bring them in? How, how do they first appear? Is there something kind of interesting uh, or unexpected there um, about um, the, the way they're brought in? So you hear this, you're talking about writing parts that actors are going to want to play. Why? Because actors get films made. Uh, um, if you can get a named actor on board, even if it's a low-budget film, you get a named actor who says, I really want to play this character. I love this character. I have to be that character. That can really help to get your film funded and, of course, get it sold um, once it's finalized, once it's completed. Producer is going to be looking at asking this question: Does your script have a clear genre? Is it comedy? Is it a thriller? Is it horror? You know, because if the genre is clear, the producer uh, can uh, is likely to be able to sell it because this is how films are actually sold as genre. Um, you know, it's much harder to sell a clear drama, uh, which is a good story with good characters and so forth. But think about whether there is a, 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 a clear genre here. And then have you put in some great money shots into your script? This is thinking uh, a, a, about your script in business terms. And the money shots are those wonderful images that can be used in trailers and on posters, uh, places like this, and help to really sell the movie because they say, wow, that's an incredible image. I've got to see that, you know. Posters still draw us in, you know. Um, you know, you just find yourself if you're on the London Underground or wherever you are, check out film posters and see which work for you and which don't. But good film posters use them using um, uh, may use a money shot, uh, and can that can be very effective. These are just a few questions here to get you thinking in these terms. So. Uh, every line you write is also a business decision. So we're right at the end now, just about to finish. And I want to uh, end here with something inspirational because I remember what it was like for me. And as I've said, I wish I knew uh, then when I started off what I know now. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there are many times where I felt you know, maybe I should just give up. But I loved and still love screenwriting and filmmaking that I had to keep going. And I will say to you, what you may feel daunted, you may feel, well, there's so much to learn. And I, 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 it will take years. But I would always say, whatever you do, follow your dream. Don't give up. Joseph Campbell, uh, he wrote a seminal book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Really, this is about the hero's journey, which is the archetypal story pattern above all. And he was actually mentor to George Lucas on the first three Star Wars, which are perfect hero journey stories. It's the, the, the young guy who really knows nothing, setting off on his journey and, you know, of course, he becomes a great Jedi warrior in time. Um, he had a wonderful saying, Joseph Campbell, and he said to inspire all of you setting off on your journey and to those of you already on it and maybe feeling despondent or lost or confused. This is what he said. He said, follow your bliss and doors will open where you thought there were none. So that's it. Follow your dream and don't give up. And what you will find is once you start on this journey uh, is that 
things will happen as if by accident, you know, an opportunity will arise. Somebody will appear on your screen that, you know, out of the blue or you realize that, that oh, I could go in this direction. I, I hadn't seen that before. And this is what happens when we open ourselves, when we, you know, broaden our perspective, doors will open and uh, you can go on your journey and, and uh, you will follow your dream. It's a wonderful process. So here we are, just to remind you then, uh, the online courses for the intro series, Breaking to Hollywood, How to Write a Great Logline and Query Letter, How to Write a Compelling Synopsis, and How to Write a Brilliant Treatment. Do these four classes and uh, uh, these will be great preparation. This will be a great foundation for your script. And um, also remember, if you want to do all four, uh, you get the, uh, you only need to pay for three. So you pay for three and get the fourth free. Um, should you not be able to attend the live class, but you've registered, don't worry, a, a recording will always be available. So you still won't really miss anything. The value of being on the live class, of course, is that um, they they will be interactive. You can ask questions as we go along. Um, but if you can't, the recording will always be available. OK, and just to say that all this information is up on my website, which is www.script-to-screen.com. Script-to-screen.com. And that's it. Thank you very much. Write with passion.